Hi everyone, uh, so my, my name is Jonathan, uh, I, I, I teach at NUS at the Department of Philosophy. So I've been doing philosophy for about 10 years already, yeah? um, and over these 10 years I've been working with uh, policy makers and uh, scientists as well. In fact, one of the most exciting projects that I worked on uh, uh, many years ago was how can we use Chinese philosophy to expand the way we think about science. Interesting, right? Yeah. So that was a quite interesting project, and I've worked with many policy makers as well. And you know, I'm going to. I know this is a very controversial title, right? Detrimental. I, I just saw one, one, one of our friends here say, "Is this the right word to use?" Ah. Uh, now, I like controversy. You know why? Because controversy makes us think, it makes us pause, and ask, "Hey, wait a minute." Yeah. And, and I like this because, you know, in my 10 years of doing Confucianism, let me put, put down my cards, right? Uh, I'm a Chinese philosopher, I love Confucian philosophy. And I use this, okay, I, I, I really, you know, I, I teach like thousands of students every year. I have like, like 20, 30 uh, teaching assistants. Uh. I run the team based on very, uh, Confucian ideas, based on Confucian philosophy, right? So I'm all for Confucianism, right? But in my 10 years of working on Chinese philosophy, I have come to discover you know, our, our friend over here, uh, Confucius, is very controversial, especially in the English-speaking world, yeah? especially among English speakers. And of course, if you talk to the, the younger generation, they'll say, Confucius, 2,500 years ago, relevant man, right? How, how does his teachings uh, relate to me? Okay, but there was a smaller problem. The bigger problem is this. A few years ago, uh, the first time I encountered this uh, controversy was when I met this guy. He's a policymaker, very, very famous policymaker. Yeah? He's, he's a, a Chinese by ethnicity. Lah, huh? And then I, I was telling him, you know, okay, I do Confucian philosophy. And I say, hey, you know, here's some ideas. And then he said, don't talk to me about Confucius. His teachings are poison. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. But this guy is a very learned person. So he knows what he's, that he's talking about. He knows his stuff, right? He knows the he knows the Lun Yu, uh, Meng Zi Xun Zi. He knows it inside out. So, so I, I was like, hey, wait a minute, why is he saying things like that? And in fact, last year I I, I met this uh, uh, professor, retired professor. He was working in Beijing for for many years. Now now he come back to Singapore, and he says, you know, Confucianism is problematic. He said. If, uh, so if you have a whole society run on Confucianism, society cannot progress. And again, this guy knows what he's talking about because he also studied the, the classics, right? He says, oh, if everybody think about family, who's going to think about society? Who's going to place society first? Yeah. So I want to highlight, you know, all these complaints that, 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 that we get from, from uh, learned people or even people who, who don't know better, you know, these complaints, uh, they're not unique to Singapore. They're not unique to modern times. In fact, the, the, the argument about you know, putting family first over society, you know who, who's the first person to say it? Mo 2,500 years ago, the first intellectual opponent of Confucius, he already said, hey, Kong Zi, what are you talking about? Yeah? You put family first, the whole society will be in trouble. Yeah? So the complaints are not new, are not unique to Singapore. In fact, you know, uh, this, this happened in China uh, a few decades ago, right? People start to ask, is there something wrong with our Chinese culture that every time when we, we Chinese people are in charge, we always keep fighting with one another? They started asking and then they say, maybe the problem is Confucianism. Yeah? Or even in South Korea, people say, hey, every time there's a problem, they say it's Confucianism. Why? Because if there's a problem, people will say, oh, but we learned that it is not my place to speak up. It is not my place to go against the authority, right? So all this is placed on Confucianism, yeah? So I invite us to explore three questions together, all right? The first question, what did Confucius really teach, yeah? And the second question is, are there problems with his teachings, yeah? Or could it be a case of, you know, what they call in English, broken telephone, you know? Over 2,500 years, maybe the message changed. Yeah, what we call Confucianism in our Chinese culture has, has somehow uh, the message just changed over the, the centuries. Like, maybe, right? <clears throat> but we also need to be frank with ourselves. Is if there are problems, what do we do? Can we still save Confucianism or can, or do we say no no it's, like like some some of the people I mentioned, they say no it's rubbish, it's poison, put aside. Or is there still something valuable about it? So I want us to seriously ponder and reflect on these three questions, yeah? So I start first with question one. What did Confucius teach? Now, just for some context, right? Confucius lived in a time 
I would like to think it's very similar to our time. Why? Because, you know, now we've got so many wars, right? The war in Ukraine and uh, Russia and so many other conflicts around the world. He was living in a time like that. It was originally very peaceful and then war starts to break out everywhere. And so Confucius started to ask the question, how do we restore the way of harmony? <clears throat> now, some context about Confucius. Uh, uh, he, he belongs to this group of people called the Ru. Okay? Uh, in modern uh, English, we like to uh, translate it as uh, the Confucians. But how can you have a group called the Confucians before if Confucius was a member of it, right? <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't the founder of the group. He was, uh, a more accurate translation would be called the literati. Yeah? So what are the literati? The literati was, was a group of scholars, yeah? learned men okay, who, who are the preservers. They study the traditions, the culture, they study the ceremonies and rituals, the knowledge, and their job is to pass it on pass on the tradition, the culture, the knowledge. Yeah? So Confucius was one of the ru, one of the literati. And in fact, in the analects, he says, I am a transmitter, not an innovator. Yeah? He's just doing his job as a ru. Yeah? So, so these are the things that he passed on. But actually, he, why do we call it Confucianism after Confucius? Because he did actually make one special adjustment. Yeah? One special change. His transmission is so special because Confucius recognized, you know, in all these traditions, all these ceremonies, right, there is a missing opportunity. Actually, you think about it, how do ceremonies restore peace if he, suppose, if he says the way to peace is through ceremony, right? He realized that actually there's something so special that we missed out, which is this, you know, all these ceremonies and culture, they can be opportunities to cultivate moral values. Ah, right. So, we start first with something simple, like sell. Nowadays, we think of it as familial obligation, right? Ah, uh, I, uh, I, I give birth to you, so therefore you have to listen to me. Uh, I raised you so many years, therefore you have to listen to me. We can use this as the platform to cultivate moral values. Rather than just, I owe you, you owe me, let's use this relationship to do something more. Let's use the ceremonies that we have, you know, even simple ceremonies, uh, like, like, like simple things like we greet one another, even simple things like that, like hello, good afternoon, right? We can use that to cultivate morality. Huh, interesting, right? That was this innovation, yeah? So one of the key fundamental uh, misunderstandings that has transmitted over the centuries is that cell, uh, what we like to call filial piety or filial reverence, is just... Um, uh, it's, it's, it's just the ultimate goal, yeah. But actually, if you read the analex, it is not the ultimate goal at all, yeah. In fact, filial piety is a means for moral cultivation. Ah, now why is it the means? It's the platform to, to, to cultivate morals. Why? Now we don't need to quote Confucius. We can quote modern days because it's very common sense, right? This is uh, from Barbara Bush, the the wife of uh, George Bush, the first the first George Bush. She said. The home is the child's first school, right? The parents are the child's first teacher, right? Yeah? And because the home is the first school, the, the parents are the first teacher, it becomes the, the base where the child learns everything from us. I remember I have a student who was saying, you know, I learned how to uh, interact with other people because of my mom who taught me how to uh, en engage with others, right? That is where it begins, yeah? So for Confucius, Cell, filial piety, filial reverence, okay, is supposed to produce two other qualities, what we call ren. Uh, some translators like to call it benevolence. I'm okay with that. Uh, I like, I prefer humanity, yeah? So it's supposed to, cell is supposed to be a means to cultivate humanity, humaneness, and lead ritual propriety. Now, let me explain what that is. Huh? So we have this, uh, NLX 1.2. It says, the trinzi, works on the root. Once the root is planted, the Tao is born. Filiality and respect for elders, are this not the roots of Ren? So what does it mean? Cell is instrumental in cultivating Ren. Ah, it's, but it is true the interactions we have with our family that we learn how to be benevolent, that we learn how to be humane. In fact, I, I like this, there's this saying in Chinese, uh, 二人为人, 
it takes to be to be humane. If I'm all by myself, how to be human, right? How to be human? I need that interaction with somebody, that practice with somebody to practice humanity, right? So that is what it's about. Now, one of the beautiful things uh, about Jean, okay, Confucius says this, is Jean distant. Is Jean far away? No. When I want to be Jean, Jean arrives. What does this mean? Say, for example, now let's say I'm, I'm in a bad mood, right? But then I realize, hey, I'm, I'm with all of you. I need to be Jean. Suddenly, what happens? It, it's, it's at the forefront of my mind, right? I need to be uh, benevolent. I need to be humane. Then, the moment I think about it, it comes. Isn't that interesting? That is the beauty of Jean. When I think about it, it comes. When I'm aware about it, it comes. Now, why is Xiao so instrumental? Because uh, it's easy to be Jean with friends, right? It's easy to be Jean with people that, that gel well with you, right? Or, yeah? It's harder to be Jean, to be human, human and humane, with people that annoy us, right or not? If you encounter a stranger and the person uh, annoys you, what's the first instinct? Bow. Huh? Bow? <laughs> run, run away, right? Oh, thank you very much. Then you, then you just walk away, correct? But why is Cell the, 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 so fundamental? Because can, can you run away from your parents? A bit hard, right? <laughs> right? So, because, so no matter how unhappy or upset or maybe you're stressed by your parents, it's not so easy to run away. And the challenge of cell is how can we, you know, this, I, I put this quote here, reflect sincerity in our demeanor. So the question is how can I elevate from obligation with parents to true genuine sincerity towards my parents? So, so I'm, uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be like, like, like small children, even like, you know, you're, you're an adult, then, then you have to take care of, of uh, your, your elderly parent also. It can be very stressful, right? There are days where, where you, you look at them and say, ah, so stressful, so tired from work. You know, then they're very frowny, right? But what, what does Confucius say? The, the key is to learn to reflect that sincerity. So no matter how tired, impatient we get, we try to be real with them. And that is why self is important, because you cannot run away or at least because of societal expectation, harder to run away from family, right? So that's why this is very important. Yeah? So through the family, we learn how to develop that uh, learn. Uh, and then of course, once we cultivate learn humanity at home, even in the most trying circumstance, then we can adapt that outwards from the family to the nation family to the Big family, the everybody, right? <laughs> that, that is the idea, right? We, we start from the home. First, we cultivate that uh, the, the humanity, how to relate well with people, sincerity, with benevolence, and then we extend out. Even when uh, it is a very trying relationship. Yeah, that is the key. But also, don't forget, and I also mentioned Lee, correct? Because family is the first home, right? So if I'm the child, I look at my parents, I look at my siblings, I look at how they interact with one another, right? I look at my uncle, I look at my aunties, uncles and aunties, I see how they interact with one another. They teach me how to interact in, in a sincere manner. I, they teach me how to uh, foster good bonds of connection with one another. That is the idea. Now, why is, why is Lee? Now, we can think of Lee in two ways, right? One is religious ceremony, yeah? Another kind of Li that Confucius also talks about is, uh, in Chinese we say what, Li Mao, right? Or in English we call etiquette, yeah? Rules of etiquette, yeah? Now, why is this important? Because you can have good feelings, but good feelings must find expression in appropriate form, correct? I give you an example. I once had a student who, who had care for me, right? Uh, who, who, as a student, you know, cares for the teacher. But the student doesn't know how to appropriately express that concern. So the student says, Oh, I really care for you. If you have any problem, you can tell me. I will here to listen for you. A bit, you, you hear, if you're a teacher, you hear a student say that, you feel a bit like weird, right? <laughs> Correct? So even if I have sincere intentions, I must learn the appropriate form to express it. Otherwise, people will misunderstand, right? Like, why is this person so creepy, right? So we need to learn Li to express well. But Li is also a good way to practice sincerity, right? To, to practice humanity because simple things like please and thank you or, or whatever other uh, social conventions we use, 
it's a good way to practice that human. You know, think about it. How often now nowadays we just say hello, hello, or, or, or bye bye, or whatever, right? How often do we mean it when we say it? Interesting, right? And, and the point of Li for Confucius is the more you try to mean it, the more you cultivate Zhen in you. Ah. So it's not just, oh, bye-bye. It's, oh, bye-bye, see you again, right? The more I try to be sincere through all these express forms, the more I cultivate the, uh, the morals within me. I like this quote from the MLS. Uh, in, in classical Chinese, it's, 寄神如神在 Sacrifice as though present. Sacrifice to the spirits as though the spirits were present. The master said, if I fail to do so in a sacrifice, it is as though there were no sacrifice. Now, I love this a lot because we we can see this, even if it's not towards uh, spirits or whatever, uh, day-to-day interaction. Have you talked to, to, to somebody who's uh, busy uh, staring at the computer? Yeah? The, the, the reply is what? Very cold, correct? Yeah? They are replying you as if you are uh, not present. Right? So, okay, now we turn around. Let's say if you are staring at the computer, you're doing work, and, and, then, and then your children or your friend come and talk to you, your loved one come and talk to you, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Ken, Ken, love you, talk to you, see you later, blah, blah, blah. Are you <laughs> present in the communication? You're not, right? So the sincerity, the benevolence, the humanity is not there. So in all communicative forms, we're supposed to be present, have that reverence for others as if it is a religious ritual. Then when I have that reverence, I am cultivating that sincerity. I tell you, I'm guilty of this. Because you know why? When I'm busy, uh, people text me, I'm like multitasking. So, so, so sometimes people get upset. Then they say, hey, can you be more present in your communication? That is what they're asking us to do. And if we make it a, con- a concerted point to be more present, people, we, we intensify the connection. Right or not? Yeah? Now, there's another dimension to Lee, okay, which is this. Lee also, because you know, Lee is a ritual, right? Uh, if you say please, then there's a script, right? Please, you ask somebody, the person do, and then the, the response is to then say thank you, right? There's a kind of like role, right? Uh, the, like a master uh, uh, host and guest or something like that. And in many ways, uh, we have many kinds of social rituals in our lives, right? This is me, and you know, I am a child to my parents, a parent to my children a spouse to my partner, a sibling to my siblings, teacher to my students, employee to my boss, member to my society's chairperson, friend to my friends. Or if you're a boss, then boss to your employees and all that, right? We have different roles. And Lee also determines the appropriateness, the, the, the different forms of appropriate expression of care, of concern, uh, towards different people. For example, I, I mean, you think of it this way. If, can I treat a student the way I, I treat my, my girlfriend? Wow, scandalous, right? <laughs> so, so, so Lee tells us what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, right? And every social role has different social expectations, right? As a child, there are certain expectations of me to do a certain thing. As a parent, there are certain expectations of me to do some other things, right? That is the role and expectations defined by Lee, by the virtue of the roles that we adopt, lah. Okay. Now. One good thing about Li for Confucius is that because it, if we practice well, right, it, is, it becomes a moral thing, right or not? And so he says, don't use laws and punishments, huh? because if you do that, what happens? People will find a way to avoid, uh, evade the law, and they will have no sense of shame. This is, you all, you all got here, this is the what, SAF, the number one rule. The number one rule in the SF. Do but don't get caught. (laughs) That is what Confucius means. If you everything is all about laws and punishment, then people will try to skirt the rules, right? But they feel bad if they if they uh, break the the rules? No, right? So when we use Li, it creates that uh, moral obligation towards other people, right? Then if I didn't do something, I don't just I, I will feel a certain sense of shame. Think about it this way. Let's say, for example, somebody uh, say bye-bye to you, but you're so busy talking to someone else that you didn't realize the person tried to say goodbye to you. Then when you realize when the person walked away, how do you feel? Ayo, I'm so, you feel bad, right? Ayo, I'm, so, I'm so sad I didn't say bye to that person, right? That is the power of Li. That when we do something wrong, then we feel a sense of shame. And then it becomes self-regulating, self-correcting. Interesting, right? Of course, if the person has no sense of shame, then what happens? Then we all shame the person, right? Then the person develops that sense of shame, correct? <laughs> now, 
so far, everything I said, right? Do you notice? Nothing in Confucianism gives us like fixed universal principles. It's like you know some 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 religions or some moral theories will say, do not steal, do not kill, do not lie, or whatever. Confucianism doesn't prescribe that. It just says, follow the best practices, do it sincerely. Interesting, right? So it doesn't provide that. Yeah. So it's all about what are the prevailing li practices in our time. Not just all li, yeah. Just just to be clear, because. For Confucius, there are good li and bad li. What are good li? Good li are the what li that helps to foster good uh, relations with other people. Bad li are the ones that makes makes it worse lah. We keep our, ourselves apart, right? Is say for example, a bad li will be what? After dinner, everybody stare at the phone. Don't don't talk at the table. That's a bad li. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so a good li will be what? If we say hey, you know, let's. Let's do the phone thing after after we we we, we part part from the table. Off the train. Yeah, right. Or, or on the train or whatever, right? So there are good li, there are bad li. So we are supposed to be able to identify what are the good li, the ones that foster better relations. Now, there are some pros and cons to Confucianism, lah. Huh? Why is the the, the 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 con of it? If you, I mean, the the pro is that yeah, it is context dependent, right? We start to uh, really exercise our moral uh, uh, brain, our moral muscles, right? Oh, is this the right thing to do to foster good connections, to 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 build better bonds with other people, right? But what's the cost? There is no universal guide. It is hard to get guidance, right? Or not? Now, but but con- the, the the defenders of Confucianism will say this is a good thing. Why? Because if you just blindly follow moral rules, then how? Then you're just a robot, right? Or not? There is no moral feelings. It's just I have to do this because I have to do it, right? So for Confucius, it's not enough. If you are just doing following moral rules without the real feelings there, then you're not human, right? Humanity means that that, that the feelings also matter, right? So the whole idea is to develop that. But now you can see where things get messy, right? If you don't have this kind of universal rules. Because if there's no universal rule, then who to say who is right, who is wrong? Correct? Now, I give you two scenarios that happens very regularly in modern times, okay? Imagine this situation. There's a middle manager, okay, abusing his powers in the organization. Ah, jala, right? Then you are just the, the small time employee, correct? Is it my place to bring it up to senior management. Depending on who you talk to, some people will say, no, it's not your place. Don't capo, right? Because it is your lead social role not to jump this kind of chain of authority, right? Ah, now you can see the problem already, right? Then also, some some people experience this. Uh, for example, in marriage, right? The mother-in-law is acting in a way that's actually hurting the family. Then if the son in, if son-in-law wants to talk to the mother-in-law, how will happen? I know this is a true story. The son-in-law says something, then the mother-in-law say, How dare you! So rude! Know your place! You are just the son-in-law. Can the doctor speak up? Also cannot, right? Know your place, you are the doctor, right? So, but again, some of you will say, no, what the mother-in-law did is wrong, right? It's context dependent, depending on you. So who's right, who's wrong? This is where this is why it gets messy, right? But for the people who say that Confucianism is detrimental, it's because it form, it becomes a way to censor people. You cannot do this. It's not your place. But if it's not anyone's place, then who gonna do, right? So one of the biggest challenge within a Confucian system is you are either seen as a rebel or a reformer. Yeah. So if you are more progressive or whatever uh, context that you're in, you might see that a person who who steps out to talk to to higher up as somebody wanting to initiate reform. But if you're the kind that says, how dare you, right? Then you will see these kind of actions as rebellious. Yeah? And this is precisely the problem that, that you hear of in uh, Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan, even in Singapore. So then the question is, how to progress if everybody uh, 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 is looking at all the small uh, underlings and saying, not your place, not your place, not your place. How to progress like that, right? So this is the question. Uh, this is the, the concern, right? Now, then the question is this. Lah. Do the problems stem from Confucianism itself? Oh. <laughs> and, and if so, what can we do? Okay, I, I tell you my, the, the quick answer, my, my view on this is, it's not Confucianism per se. 
Okay, so those of you the the, the supporters of confucianism, you all can sigh, you can sigh a breath of relief. Phew! <laughs> I don't think the problem is sense of Confucius teaching. Yeah? And in fact, I want to use this as an opportunity. Because you see, one thing I love about Confucianism is that on one hand, it teaches us how to cultivate morality, right? On the other hand, every time there are problems in society, this philosophy gives us a framework to study what's wrong with our society. And now I want to tell, use Confucianism to identify what are the problems that prevent Confucianism from being beneficial. Yeah? Or in other words, what are the conditions that are making people say Confucianism is detrimental today? Okay? So, I, 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 there are two things. One is models, and the other are best practices. Okay, so what do I mean? Now, some of the, like I said just now, some of the Li are not good Li, correct? Some Li can, uh, instead of uh, fostering better relations, actually separates us. Now, the misunderstanding of Confucianism is we are supposed to keep every Li. So don't question, all of you are supposed to follow that Li. That's actually a misunderstanding. And if you look into the NLS, there's this passage. The master wished to dwell amongst the uncivilized tribes, barbarians, lah, right? Then someone said, what would you do about their crudeness, their lack of refined goodly, right? And then Confucius said, when a tree dwells amongst them, what crudeness could there be? What he means is, when I go to them with my best practices, best communicative practices, they will be won over by these best practices. They will learn the best practices from me, and we will start exercising best practices. So it doesn't mean that just because we're stuck with a bad lead, that, that we stick with it. If we find that there are certain communicative practices, certain social rituals, social conventions that are counter to fostering good relations, then you know what? Maybe we can start searching for better best practices. Yeah. So this is a, 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 you can call it a progressive way of reading Confucianism, lah, right? We can look for it, and that is what Confucius uh, is advocating. In fact, elsewhere in the NLX, he does say, he, you know, he's a transmitter, right? But he pick and choose one, no. He said, this lead is bad, don't transmit. This lead is good, transmit. Yeah? So we can follow in the ways of Confucius and do likewise. So that is best practices. Second one is models. So I introduce you to this concept in Confucianism that few people talk about. Maybe only in academic circles. Have you all heard of this rectification of names? Okay, some of you heard of it. Huh? Zheng Ming is, is a, I know there's another Chinese word called Zheng Ming, but this is a different kind of Zheng Ming. Now, I start with this passage that will make you go, hey, okay? <laughs> it, it, it goes like this. Huh? Zi Lu, this is the, uh, one of Confucius' disciples, said, If the ruler were to entrust you, Confucius, to govern his state, what would be your first priority? Yeah? So, if you are the, the first, the prime minister of the state, what's the first thing to do? He said, the first thing I will do is to rectify names. Then I know some of you is like, huh? Oh, what? <laughs> Shouldn't you like you know, set up better policies or what, uh, something like that? No, he says, so, so Zulu say, what are you talking about? So Confucius says this, if names are not right, then speech does not accord with things. If speech is not in accord with things, then affairs cannot be successful. When affairs are not successful, Lee, our social conventions and rituals, and music do not flourish. And when they do not flourish, then sanctions and punishments miss the mark. And when they miss the mark, people have no place to set their hands and feet. Okay, a bit, maybe a bit cheap. Huh? So, uh, oh, therefore, a Jin uh, gives things names that they may be properly spoken of. And what is said may be properly enacted. With regard to speech, the Jin Zi permits no carelessness. I explain, huh? Now, this picture, I'm going to show you a picture that, that, that went viral on the internet a few years ago, okay? He, here's a picture of, uh, here's the picture. This guy thought that he, he his girlfriend, uh, boyfriend with a girl, but you can see clearly the girl uh, is not interested in him uh, romantically, correct? So, so the guy thought, okay, let, let me do the hardship, and then the girl, didn't reciprocate, she just like that. <laughs> and and, and for, for, the, for the youth, they like to call this word, Friend zone. <laughs> that means the, the girl doesn't see him as a boyfriend material, you are friend material only. <laughs> now, this is a good example of rectification of names. Because why? If if you are the, 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 the guy, right, you'll be wondering, hey, this interaction that, that, that I have with you, if, are we just friends or are we boyfriend girlfriend? Notice uh, if we rectify the name, the guy will behave accordingly, right? If we leave it to ambiguity, the guy also don't know. Do I do this or do I do this? Right? <laughs> so, 
what are we? What are we to each other? We need to rectify names. The problem is, why, why, why the Confucius say people don't know where to place their head and feet? Because you, you don't know what you are in relation to other people. This Our friend here don't know whether to hold hand or not to hold hand because he don't know friend or boyfriend or friend, right? So likewise, this can extend to so many things around us. Huh? The key is, names are normative. They prescribe certain action. It's just like boyfriend or friend. The moment we say, we name them, you are husband and wife, Eh? The, 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 somehow the dynamics is a bit different. How we behave is also different, right? If I tell you I am a student, you will treat me like a student. If I tell you I'm a lecturer, you treat me as a lecturer, right? Names are names prescribe action. But more than prescribing action, let's link it back to social roles. Huh? When we name things, we are also setting exemplary models for others to follow. Yeah. So just as how a child in the home looks to the parents and say, okay, my father do this, my mother do this, and then they call this love. If let's say the, the parents keep beating the child and call this love, what, what is the child going to learn? Be everyone. Be everyone is love, right? If the father and mother um, uh, express more concern, more care, and they call this love, the child will also learn differently, right? So, one of the key things about Zheng Ming, rectifying names, is when we name something, we are also declaring this to be a exemplary model. So when we say, oh, this is a good student, this is a good parent, uh, employee of the month or employee of the year, or this is good conduct or whatever good acts, right? we are implying this is the exemplary model. In other words, follow, follow the model, right? Confucius in the Analects, he says, um, if the emperor only cares about himself, takes the wealth from the people just for his own pleasure, is he an emperor? No, he's not an emperor. He is a, we rectify, he is a robber. So if the parents don't uh, treat their children properly, don't know, fulfill the end of the obligation, can we really call them parents? No. I mean, in English we say bad parents, lah, right? But the idea is, when we say that these are bad parents, these are bad emperor, bad, bad emperor, right? Then we are saying, don't follow this model. Ah, right. Now, think about Confucius time, 2,500 years ago. Last time we got emperor to, to, to rectify names and, 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 and set the models. Last time we got all the kampung, right? All the village, then we got the village chief who will, will identify the exemplary people. Now, society is so big. How, how many of your neighbors do you know? Don't know, right? Do you even know your own community leader? Some of you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> right? But the problem is, we know emperor, we don't have all these community leaders setting models, right? Then how? Who's setting it for us? Ah, Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> no, you're not wrong, right? If no one is setting the models, we will own self find models that we think should be exemplary to us. And sometimes we make wrong decisions or unwise decisions, right? So, here's the challenge. What challenge does uh, Confucianism face in modern society? And what can we do so that Confucianism can be beneficial, okay? Now, I will tell you, uh, I actually, this, my, the answer I'm going to tell you is actually inspired by a book project that I worked on uh, in 2019, yeah? Uh, oh, it's coming out in Lenhe tomorrow, book award, yeah? It's, it's about this guy, uh, he's 103 years old now, but before that, he was actually the uh, World War II veteran, and he used to be the grandfather of SIA. He trained the first 300 pilots, yeah? Now, I, you know what, when I work on, with the project with him, I, I gain a, a, a lot of insights because I realized, you know, as a young person, the older people don't tell me a lot of their stories. So in other words, I don't have many models on how to be a good leader, right? So it's only when I started working with him uh, on his uh, uh, life story that I started to learn, oh, here's a model on how to manage other people. Here's a model on how to handle difficulties, hardship. And I thought to myself, hey, very precious. If I didn't talk to him, I wouldn't have learned all this. I would be struggling for most of my adult life. And then he made me aware, you know what? You know, I, I teach, uh, every, every year I teach about like 1,000 students. So I teach seven years, about 7,000 students. Huh? A lot of them, a lot of students are very clueless because there are no role models. Very few role models, very few models of examples. Huh. They, they, are, they are telling me, we don't know what to expect after graduation. No one tells us anything. Our parents don't tell us anything. Why? Because we think that because of all the changes in technology, the experiences of the older people, 
are not relevant to the younger people. But one thing I learned from the 100-year-old guy is human experience is still the same. Technology changes, but the human experience is still the same. So, here are the three things that we can do. right? Here are the three problems and the things that we can do. There are fewer exemplary models. If you think about it, in your day-to-day -day life and conversation, how many times do you say, hey, I met this person, very inspiring, I want to live up to, to this person. Do you say that regularly? No, right? Most of the time, it's like, what la, why this person like that? What la, why that person like that, right? We don't have good models. In fact, the models around us are very xiaojen, xiao ti, very petty, right? So this is also affecting everyone around us. Our young people are not learning exemplary, inspiring models. How to be moral if you haven't met anyone who's moral, right? Then also, cell is supposed to be the first, first home, right? Family is supposed to be the first home. But now, increasingly, we've got more broken families. Where are our children going to learn uh, through cell how to be uh, uh, humane, benevolent, right? And in fact, most if you notice, it's not just familiar obligation, right? Cell is elevating from fa family obligation. How many of us are even doing that without children? Ah, so this is a problem, right? So, and then the last one, fewer the best practices circulating around for young people to learn. Yeah, I realized I, I wasn't learning anything from, 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 from my parents or the other adults until I started working with the 100 year old guy for his uh, um, uh, life story. Then I realized, oh, it's so precious, you know, all these stories. Then I start to learn. So, this is what our, uh, the, so our society needs. For Confucianism to be beneficial once again, we need this. The reason why people say it's detrimental is because right now, we don't have many best practices. We don't have many inspiring, exemplary uh, models. So what are we modeling after? Xiaojun, Xiaoqi kind of models, very petty models. Yeah? And sometimes unrealistic models because of media, Hollywood. Right? So I think this is something that we need to think about. Um, I mean, we, we, we don't have an emperor, but what can we do to promulgate, to promote better models and better practices, better communicative practices uh, in the uh, with the people around us? And I think, um, as someone, I, I think of myself as a Confucian, right? As a Ru, Ru as well. And, and I see as part of my task as an educator, as a teacher, to really uh, promote these two things with my, with my students. Lah. So maybe we can, we can do that too. So, well... That is all that I have to say, so thank you so much.